Indian weddings are known around the world as grand, lavish, and memorable spectacles. But were they the same colourful extravaganzas 5,000 years ago? The Indian subcontinent was not only one of the cradles of civilization, but also arguably the birthplace of the institution of marriage. So, for a civilization that never ceased to exist, how much does tying the knot in present day differ from the past? Today on Nutty History, we're walking down the historical aisle to see what marriage was like in ancient India. While many human societies of history were male dominant, Indian civilization had a different beginning. Graves found at the Harappa indicate that the Indus Valley civilization was actually a matriarchy. This meant that the women were the head of the household and were in charge of all important decisions within married life. Archaeological findings have suggested that in Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, it was the groom who would move into his bride's house after marriage. It was only the brides who married foreigners that moved away from their homes and towns. These marriages were business arrangements meant to strengthen trade and commerce. Who needs love when you have foreign silk? The houses that married couples lived in were traditionally made of baked bricks and varied depending on the wealth of the family. Fancier abodes might have more than one floor and perhaps a courtyard. In day-to-day -day life, priests were responsible for instructing children in reading, writing and general academia, while the family was responsible for teaching them crafts. A fam that crafts together stays together. It's unfortunate that Harappan priests aren't around anymore to answer some of our more burning questions about Indus Valley's marital customs. Our knowledge remains pretty limited, since we still haven't deciphered their script. Anyone have the digits for the guy that cracked the zodiac code? With the advent of Indo-Aryans in the northern Indian plains, the gender roles changed and the patriarchy found its way to India. The Vedic religion was relatively liberal on a woman's career choices, but it did put her in a box when it came to marriage. In the Vedic system, a woman was considered her father's chattel before marriage and then her husband's property thereafter. Anyone else feel like we're going backwards? Still, women were considered to play an equal role of importance in the marriage, and everything was shared between spouses. The perfect power couple of this age was supposed to follow the ideals of godly duos such as Rama Sita or Shiva Sati, who were each considered incomplete without their spouse. But what about the big day? In the Vedic period, there were eight different types of wedding ceremonies, depending upon how the couple came into an agreement for the union. Most importantly, whichever type of wedding was held, they were bound together in marriage. And if we believe the religious texts, they were in it not just for life, but for the next seven lives. Yeah, we're not sure how easy it is to find a divorce lawyer in the afterlife. One unique kind of wedding ceremony was called Swayamvara. The bride would choose her groom out of many suitors assembled at one place. This also might involve some sort of skill test for the hopeful men, such as an archery competition, or the bride-to-be presenting a riddle to test their wit. Other wedding ceremonies involved the father donating his daughter as a bride, gifting her as a bride, or accepting a dowry for her as a bride. While it sounds a bit like we're talking about a crate and barrel dish set instead of an actual human woman, the daughter's consent was usually involved in the decision-making. It's to small victories. As for actually having romantic feelings towards your special someone, love marriages in the Vedic era were technically allowed, but weren't entirely socially acceptable. These weddings were called Gandhava Viva, named after Gandhavas, an elf-like mythological creature. They still showed some love for love though. India's native name Bharat actually comes from the mythical King Bharat, who was conceived of a love marriage between his father King Dushyant and a nymph, Shakuntala. Not all marriages of the Vedic period involved just two people. Polygamy was allowed for both genders, to an extent, but was more common among men. Kings and emperors were more likely to have multiple wives, as the women of the royal families acted as diplomatic ambassadors. So the more neighbours you had to your kingdom, the more wives you might require. Kids of the time, specifically boys, were mainly the responsibility of local sages and priests who taught and groomed them for life's hardships. Girls, on the other hand, were the sole responsibility of their mothers and were supposed to train to be wifey material for most of their adolescent years. Around 500 BCE, Vedic systems evolved to Orthodox Hinduism and things for women took a turn for the worse. This change in status, in turn, altered the social fabric of the institution of marriage. The concept of Devdasi, wives of the gods, also emerged during this time. Priests and acolytes might demand that families donate their daughters to temples and other religious establishments, 
these women were essentially slaves of the head priest and higher clergy. This practice also ended up pushing the boundaries of acceptable marriage age for women to an uncomfortable degree. As families didn't want to be pressured into sending their daughters into slavery, they would marry them off as early as possible. While during the Vedic era, marriage age for women averaged around age 15, with the advent of Orthodox Hinduism, it came down to age 10. The changing time also became a lot more problematic for widowed women. But don't worry, not for the men, silly. They were always allowed to remarry. If a woman was unfortunate enough to lose her husband, she was treated as a living curse and would be stripped of all material luxuries and comforts. Widowed women were then expected to live in isolation and with minimum necessities, if they were allowed to live at all. Some parts of ancient India forced widows to climb up onto their dead husband's pyre and allow themselves to be immolated. Some women would do this willingly to be venerated in the afterlife, but mostly women weren't inclined to incinerate themselves to death. Weird. This began one of the darkest chapters of Indian history, which sadly prevailed up until the 19th century. While some marital customs like this have been left in the past, other traditions still exist in modern-day India. Couples will still marry by looping a bonfire seven times, and married women are still called Ardhangini, which means husband's other half. So do you think you're ready to commit to your partner for the next seven lives? 